Welcome to Cashflow Savannah. This is part three of Chandler's in my interview with Jabbar Adesada. Jabbar is a very good friend. We had a fantastic interview with him. And I think that you'll see that he really ties up his story beautifully with this final part of this episode. Enjoy. In the Savannah, Incredible. Georgia area. And it was my first property. I was finally, I was a homeowner. I was a real estate investor. And so now I had the property, but I had to get tenants. I had to get roommates. Quick. And then I got called away to go halfway across the country oh. to Yuma, Arizona for field training. Randomly. I found out a week that I, I was remember going. that. Yeah. And so I had to rent to, I rented out the rooms while I was out over there. So I learned long distance real estate investing. Like immediately I had like a bunch of crash courses oh, man. of problem solving. It was amazing. I had so many different lessons I learned from that deal, mm -hmm. but like that deal was like the per deal that catapulted me to where I am yeah. now. Well, the smartest thing you did on that too, Jabbar, and tell me if I'm wrong, I could get my facts wrong. I'm telling you, your life. But you didn't rent out four of the five bedrooms. You rented out five out of five yeah. of the bedrooms and you lived in on the, the common side. area. Yeah. And I mean, that brought you an extra how much in cash flow every month? That, that was probably like most of the cash flow. That was the game changer. That year, I did the math. I did the math. I was telling people I was cash flowing 1200 I cash flowed $1,500 a month. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Of that one deal. Well, and of all the uncomfortable things you did in your life, that was probably the least uncomfortable thing you did. Easiest. Mm -hmm. Easiest thing. Easiest thing ever. It was literally no... Like, people look at it and like, oh my God. But I'm like, yeah. I'm 19, dude. <laughs> I sleep outside all, for a, yeah. I sleep outside right. for a living, you know. Well, at that point in your career, career, you weren't even in Savannah that often. Like you were I was gone in Savannah more three months that year. Right, yeah. you were gone more than you're here. I was always trying to get with you, and you're like, I'm still in Yuma, or I'm in, out in California. And yeah. Who cares if you're sleeping on the couch? You know, technically you live there. Yeah. But it was to me, it was fantastic. So what was your second deal after that house? What did you do? Because you learned a ton. Would you say that that's the deal you've learned the most on of all of them? Absolutely, yeah. That first deal. Yeah, that first deal like taught me so much. It still teaches me a lot to this day. So my second deal, that first deal gave me the confidence to do the second deal because I was like, whoa, this is a success. I know what I'm doing. So then that's when I started using other people's money. I don't know. <laughs> like, so, because I, so I was thinking, I was listening to a lot of bigger pockets. I was like, all right, how are we going to get to $10,000 a month in cash flow realistically? And I was like, because um, I knew I could get to four. I knew I could be financially free, but, you know, I'm always hitting goal, setting goals and I'm like figuring out how to beat them. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, um, you won't be able to do it on your own unless you buy some crazy deals because your average house tax is only going to bring you like let's say an extra i'm only going to account for an extra thousand dollars a month because i know i can find that and you knew the lending was going to be a real problem is that correct yeah. for the second deal because you had so much trouble with the first and, right and i'm sure that kind of forced you to be creative exactly so i knew i couldn't get the loan and nothing like that i knew i didn't have the money i'd spend yeah. all my money on the first house that first house i spent twenty two thousand dollars on it mm -hmm. and so and i was like literally all my money yeah <laughs> so um what I decided to do was I decided to um, like say, okay, I need to figure out how to use other people's money instead and then use the other components that I'm good at to bring them enough value to where I can hit my goals and help them hit their goals. So I had met this guy and he's one of my biggest private money lenders now. Thank you, Eli, Eli, po Eli Poisnecker. He um, owns a couple, he owns a bunch of cabins. And he's telling me how he's killing them on these cabins in the Smoky Mountains. Yes, like cabins are doing fifty thousand dollars a year in cash flow per wow. property. Yeah. I was like, what is this? An apartment building? He's like, nah, man, that's a regular Joe Smoky cabin. I was like, no way. <laughs> I was like, because I, I was thinking, like, man, you get like three of these, you you know, you're, you're doing well. So then I was There's like, my ten thousand. Yeah, and so I was like, okay. I need to figure out how to get these. And so I started pitching them hard to people. And I got told no a bunch of times. But then eventually I got good at raising money doing that because I started learning like, okay, you're talking too much. This is what people actually want to hear. This is what people actually care about. Things of that nature. And then um, I remember I finally found this person and he was a, per I never met this guy before. And I was even, I remember um, the way that we he invested in me was, I wasn't even trying to have him invest in the deal. I was literally just like, man, like I have this amazing opportunity and I know people are getting $200 a month in cash flow. I, I don't understand why like I'm pitching them an opportunity for them to do no work 
and get way more, like at least a thousand dollars of cash flow, and they're not taking me off of my offer. Like, I really don't get it, man. Like, what do you think? This is me just vented to him. And he goes, I'm interested in that. So I <laughs> sold him without even trying to sell him, like yeah. being genuinely just venting to him. And he, he said, I just need to talk to my wife. He talked to his wife, and then we bought our first property together. I've had that same kind of deal happen where I was just telling him about, like, hard money or private money. And, like, two days later, they called, like, hey, like, you were talking about private money. Like, I bitched it. And I was like, that's oh, great. Sweet. Heck, yeah. So. Yeah. Give me some water. No, 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 no. I was thinking about where my retainers were. So I realized I put them in my pocket. <laughs> I'm scared. I lost them. So, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> so really i have like three questions like i really want to ask dime senor all right here we go i don't know what you just said but Tell we're me. Gonna let it rock. all right so the first one is and i know me and marcel talk about this all the time um and we kind of agree here he, we talk about um just kind of like people have totally just don't even think about income anymore and it's just like hey invest in this real estate and you're gonna be rich mm-hmm. so we're like if you look at most of the you know, successful real estate investors, they figure out a way to make a pretty sizable income and then they have a ton of money to invest in real estate. You are kind of like an ex- exception, but you have found a way to make some income now. Do you think you need to do that or do you think? Uh, this question is hard. People That's ask this question, question now yeah. and like my perspective is so different. So. I think, like, you just figure out what you need to do to get started. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing is starting. But, like, it is a a lot easier to invest in real estate when you have money. But then when you have money, you then take some, like, for me, I take on risks that are very expensive. You know, so it almost feels like you never have money, truly, you know, because it's always been spent on a property. I I just told you guys, I I have a contractor hitting me with a $50,000 budget increase on one of my properties, on one of my projects. So, like, um... And that has to come out of pocket, you know. Yeah. I I made more than that. I made more than that, like you know, you know this this month, and now like a lot of that's going towards my my like <laughs> you know like rehab yeah. repairs, you know, on a on a separate project. So I think real estate's a lot easier when you have a lot of money. I think having money personally is a lot more important when you're trying to scale. But yeah. I think like when we're just talking about like from an investment property standpoint, like. I used investment properties to increase my income because I was going after cash flow. Yeah. So I think it really depends on how you're investing. Like, do I think you should be making two thousand dollars a month and then you want to try and buy two hundred dollar a month property? Is that like the? I think a house hack might be more wise for you to cut down your expenses um, rather than trying to generate ge- generate two hundred dollars a month off of property. You know what I'm saying? But um, because the, that's appreci- that's an appreciation game. That's not a cash flow yeah. game. Mm-hmm. So like two different models. Two different models, you know. But if you're going for heavy cash flow, like that's an inc- income yeah. increase because then now the business is supporting itself. But even with that, capex is a real thing, man. And I Shoot. learned that thing. Like so that was like ten thousand dollars. I kind of wanted to get yeah. off of because we we're a bigger pockets, and I was kind of listening to you, and that's the first time I've heard you say it. You're kind of like. You kept saying cash flow in quotations is not really a thing. And now I kind of want to get towards the big sexy stuff. Can you explain why you want to do that? Um, Because you're doing so well with just a single family. Why would you want to kind of, and you talked about you want to go towards big commercial buildings. So yeah. And you kind of want to get away from single family. Can you explain all that and why you would want to do that? So where I'm at right now is like, I'm still a very competitive, growth-minded person, yeah. yeah? So, like, I look at money a lot differently because when I had, when I first started my investment journey, I had no money, no resources, no connections. Now I have a little bit, teeny, teeny, teeny bit of money, a little teeny, teeny, teeny bit of resources, and I have some connections. So now I'm like, okay, how can I leverage that to make a lot of money, a lot of resources, and a lot of connections? Because that is going to just keep on propelling the abundance that, you know, the abundance, yeah. mm-hmm. the actual abundance. So, like, cash flow, I believe, is meant to be a defensive mechanism to control the asset. Like, you're using cash flow to cover your expenses. This is my belief. So, like, you want a lot of cash flow because your properties come, like, you're going to have a lot of expenses and the cash flow is going to cover a lot of those expenses. Yeah. So, cash flow from business. 
I believe is like really is a, depending on the business obviously is what you want to have to then invest in assets and then you use the assets and then you want to use the cash flow from the assets to pay for the assets but really the big wealth is made in the appreciation mm -hmm. and loan pay down over time so when you're getting the appreciation and then the debt tenants and the renters are paying your debt down, now you're getting that big wealth. And then like now when you have a million dollars in equity, now you can you could you just have more options, more money, more options, more equity, more more abilities to get a higher return on equity or at least an a bigger return on uh, like cash flow. Because like now you can instead of that property you're making five hundred dollars a month on now you have if you have a million dollars of equity or maybe let's say you're making a thousand dollars a month on it now you have a million dollars of equity now you can go go and take that million dollars of equity out via lines of credit or cash out refis or sales or ten thirty ones and then you can get a much bigger cash flow by putting it into something that's meant for cash flow mm -hmm. like a multifamily like a RV part like these other different businesses within real estate or different business altogether. So I believe that now for me, I'm more, I'm more interested in the appreciation because I have cash flow from business and uh, yeah, I have cash flow from business. So I use that cash flow to live off of a, a small percentage of it. The remaining cash flow goes towards all my, my big rehab increases and then investing in more assets. Mm -hmm. And then now I peruse for assets where I can get some big appreciation to then build the bigger wealth. Cause then now like, instead of having a bunch of properties, let's say I have, let's say 10 properties make me $10,000 a month. I can just go buy one building that makes that's that's meant for cash flow mm -hmm. that spits out that money. Yeah. And then on top of that, if it's a commercial building, I have control over the appreciation to where like now I'm able to basically play a game of, okay, what options do I want to go with? If I have an opportunity to buy this thing below market value and then I can increase the operations, increase the NOI, and I increase the, the, the value of that building, now I can create that opportunity for myself. But in the single family space, it doesn't matter that I increase the income on that property. Mm -hmm. It's still a single family home. It's still going to be valued based off of what the single family homes next to it sold for. Okay. So I don't get yeah. that benefit. And on top of it, single family homes are just not meant like just traditionally they're meant, they're not meant to be like huge, heavy cash flow machines. Yeah. They're meant to Which, be appreciating assets over the long term. Cause that's why you're ever seeing home family. Home. They're not cash flowing crazy. Yeah. We forced them to cash flow crazy with like, different strategies yeah. like Airbnb sh or short term rentals, um, medium term rentals, rent by bedroom, nursing homes and things like that. But really they're just meant, they're really like in their most purest form, they're just appreciation machines. So like that's how I look at all of my single family homes, just yeah. knowing that about them because the government treats them that way, you know, with all these regulations that they put on us. So I know that like it's more important for me to just treat them as a business that's paying for themselves. I, yes, I receive cash flow off of them, but I just use that cash flow to continue to stack up for when they, either I have a crazy um, expense or I just use it to buy more properties and now mm -hmm. I'm saving all that to then transition into things where I can actually control my destiny mm -hmm. on the appreciation because I believe the real money is made on the appreciation. Yeah. You've moved from the five greenhouses to the one red hotel. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Yeah. You're, you're thinking bigger. As am I. Yes. And that's great. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, no, because I was, it's always been kind of confusing for me getting in because I, I listened to the Bigger Pockets podcast and they would always just talk appreciation, appreciation, appreciation. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. And they would say, I remember them saying like, yeah, $200. And cash flow is awesome. I don't like that. You remember? Like, you yeah, remember yeah, yeah. It is awesome in this market, yeah, may I it's say. It's great in this market. It's unheard sure. of, actually. And um, so that's kind of how I was thinking. I was like, all right, 200 bucks, that's just kind of the cherry on top. And um, and then you kind of get into it over like, no, only cash flow. Because you hear so many different people. And then uh, it just really, I was like, you went back to appreciation. I was like, ah, oh, okay. Because that's where I've always kind of learned. 
And that's kind of always what I've agreed with was the appreciation play mm -hmm. and not the cash flow play. But so. your average investor needs to start with one single family home. Yeah. Everyone should start there. Mm -hmm. Everyone. In fact, I had someone call me several months ago and say, I want to invest in Savannah. I want a 50 unit apartment complex. I said, oh, cool. Tell me about yourself. You know, what? what's your portfolio look like? Oh, I've never bought an investment property before. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm just wow. like, okay. yeah, like I respect it. You know, but I've had the same mindset as you, Jawar. You can ask Chandler last year, year and a half. I've been like, I'm only going after big. I'm done with single families. But my question for you on this, because I know you have single families in your portfolio, as do I. I still really believe in the asset class. They're really not making more of them. And to me, once you have your hands on a solid single family home in a great location, I actually plan to keep mine forever because they aren't going to make more of those. You know, the building is really turning into more multifamily and you might get any outskirts or things like that. So I actually really believe that they're going to do very well over time. But I agree with you. What would I buy next week? It's probably not going to be a single family home. It's probably going to be a bigger deal. That's just been my mindset and I've been able to make that happen. So do you plan to kind of hang on to the singles that you have? Or are you going to turn it all up into bigger deals? Like what are you, what is your mindset with that? For me personally, I'm not attached to any single one of my properties. Mm -hmm. No property am I, am I attached to. So I look at it from an opportunistic standpoint. If I have an opportunity to transfer that wealth and that property to a better opportunity, that's what I'm doing. But if okay. I don't have that opportunity, then I'm going to keep it. Okay. So if I have yeah. a home that has a million dollars in equity, even it doesn't matter how long I, if that was my first house, it doesn't matter if I'm in love with this house, you're going to go. <laughs> you know? Bye bye. Yeah. Because yeah, the return <laughs> on equity, like it's a math equation. If I'm able to make, if I'm only making $4,000 a month, and I have a million dollars in equity, that's a 4% return yeah. on equity, right? Like 40,000, that's that. That's You're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 48,000. So, um, yeah, something like that. So I would rather, I'd much rather, tra yeah, it's 4.8. So if I much rather, mm -hmm. if I know I can get a 10% return on a million dollars, I'm going to do that. Cause like that, that's, you know, that like I'm the return on equity at that point in time, right now I'm not getting the highest and best use on my return on equity. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to transfer that wealth to a, to an asset or an investment venture. It's a good mindset. Where I'm getting a much higher return on my equity. One thing I've always pushed you on and you've always fought me and we have different mindsets on this and I, but I've really been impressed with how well you've done. I've always had the mindset as an investor that when you get started, you get started and you get your hands dirty and you get in there and do it because I didn't have very much money when I started. And the only way I was able to get properties of cash flow was to get in and paint them myself and do the yard and, and come trim the bushes and things like that. And I've always been amazed. I'd say, Jabbar, you're not doing any of the work, like none of it, not even getting your own subs. And you have literally walked in the door and been like, I don't do that. I never will. I'll figure it out. And you always have. I've never once seen you swing a hammer. Talk about that because you're very unique because that's not typical for most investors. Most of us have, I had to do it and I learned a lot and actually it was great for my children to have to go through that experience as well. But what's your answer to that? Because I, I love that you're an outlier on that. I'm not above it, but I think that like I did not invest in real estate to do that. Yeah. Like I, I told myself from the beginning because I, I just did not invest in real estate to do that. And so like my first house, I painted like a very, I, my first house, I took two Marines on a 96, which is our four, or, our um, four day Liberty weekend period, um, 96 hours. And I told them I was having a party at my new house. <laughs> and then I, we went to Home Depot. Yeah. I swear they they hate me. To, they, will, they will tell you. They will. I could call them right now and they will tell you the story. And then I took them to my house. I got them pizza afterwards, but we were painting and changing electrical fixtures. And by they, by we, I mean they. <laughs> I, I so painted, you have yet to pick up a paintbrush. I painted brush. a little bit. Like I painted the. Um, at my at my first Smiley house. Smiley face. There's a that trim. You said your trim. Yeah. I have like a brick um, arch. I painted that by myself. Okay. Okay, come on. Yeah, he does something. <laughs> and then I painted, um, I changed like some doorknobs. Um, and then I changed, I painted a little bit of the fireplace. Like maybe Quite like. Man. 
Yeah, like probably like 25% of the fireplace, okay. that was me. And then you retired. Yeah. And then I was done. I was like, never again. It's, ama it's amazing to me that you've been able to do that. I, I've, you're the only investor I know. I've done furniture, though. Furniture, I think, is worse. I did furniture furn is horrendous. Yeah. I did furniture yeah. at... Um, no, I didn't do furniture at the house. I never actually did it. Never mind. No, no, no. <laughs> I, tr I attempted... Yeah. I attempted furniture at my cabin... And then I think I only bought like really, really small stuff. That thing was a nightmare. And I was like, never. But then I think the cleaners ended up doing everything else. Yeah. I did, I tried to do furniture at my, my sub two house in Beaufort. And I, I, I was miserable there too. So I, I did the same thing. I, I got a bunch of Marines and then I gave them, uh, what I got? I got a Mexican food after, um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm not, I just didn't yeah. get a real estate to do it. I'd rather yes. pay. So you well, built it into your numbers and just yeah. made it happen. I built it into my numbers and like, even if it went over my numbers, I still didn't yeah. care. <laughs> I was like, hey man, this to is kinda, just more expensive. To kind of build on that, it's so funny you just asked this. I was listening to a podcast the other day and um, the guy was kind of explaining the whole, like, yeah, I don't do any of the work. Um, he was explaining why he used to do the work. And then he explained how he was like, he was flipping homes and he was like, man, I was flipping homes. I was able to do one a month, but I was doing all the work and I was there. And then finally I hired a property or a project manager for like a thousand bucks a month. And he was like, that gave me that much time to go find more deals, which he was really good at. He's like, I was really good at finding more deals. So it then turned from one property a month to four properties a month, which made it way easier for him to pay for that project manager. And then like, he was like, mm -hmm. it just made way more sense. He was like, I wasn't, he was like, if I didn't hire that project manager, I would have been just doing one project a month and not finding deals. And I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. But um, yeah, it's just real, it's real interesting. Get in well, there. I don't do, like both sides. I don't do my own work now. I don't yeah. do anything, mm -hmm. but I, I, I have more money to pay for it. So I, I have money. <laughs> And that's what amazes me is I know for a fact you didn't have a ton of money when you got in either, but yeah. I just respect the heck out of the fact that you just figured it out anyway. But also, I also went to the perspective that like I had to learn how to delegate from the very beginning because I was gone so much. Yeah. Yeah. Like I physically was not in that's Savannah. True. So I had no choice but to outsource because like unless I wanted to pay the mortgage for the, I bought this property to pay the mortgage. For the next 12 months you know like i need to learn how to get somebody else to go here and do it for me and let and trust in people and figure out processes to hold them accountable even though i'm not there so i'm actually grateful i didn't do the work because it really got me gave me a skill set of being yeah. able to do that even if i get screwed over all the time but like i get screwed over less and less i don't it's never the same trick yeah. you know for sure wow you're just amazing, Jabbar. So where are you today? Like, uh, we, you started with that one home. You went through 19 lenders, 19 years old. 19 lenders at 19 years old, that's incredible. <laughs> and, I you know, that's funny. And it's roughly three years later now yeah, that we're almost. sitting here together. And Lord knows what you're going to do in the next three years. But from one house, where are you today? Do you know the number of doors in your portfolio? So right now... Out of the, we have, we have like, I think 31 or 32 pro, like doors. We have 31 or 32 doors, that's but that's consistent of like a lot of flips as well. Okay. Out of the doors, out of the projects that we have, 25 of them are keeps. Like we're going to keep, right. keep them like, uh, maybe 19 or 20 of them are like actively rented right now but then like they're in like some of them are also getting transitioned from like long-term rental to, mm -hmm. to short-term rental but we're waiting for leases to end um and then the rest of them are flips um i'm a millionaire now it didn't take me until i was 34 to do that <laughs> um i beat that goal by literally the um biggest i think the biggest attributor to that was the assets though like, cause, so that's like why it's hard for me to sit here and say like, oh no, you should make money first. Cause that's not what I did. Yeah. But, and I don't think like if I would have started, I don't know what would it would have looked like if I would start there. Cause my net worth is in my assets, you know? So that I've saved up a million dollars in cash. No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So like that is, that's another thing to consider. It's like, uh, I know people who make a lot of money. Um, but they're not millionaires and i don't consider being a millionaire like anything but i think the biggest thing about being a millionaire is like 
I can I can play like Monopoly, like the example you gave is like if something happens, I just don't have to be a millionaire anymore. You know, yeah. I can sell my assets. You know, right. I have assets I can borrow against. I have like that. You know, a part of me to be able. It just gives me equity. Gives you options. Yes. Um. So that is the case, and then like we flip. Me, and my business partner Marcel is my best friend. Um. We bought, we bought in, we, I mean, we were buying properties weekly, like multiple mm-hmm. properties a week yeah. for like a while. We literally stopped buying properties every, every single week. And, um, when do we stop doing that? Probably like a month now. Yeah. We've cooled down. Cause it's just like crazy. Um, yeah, that's it. That's fantastic. Well, and it kills me that people don't understand the concept of real estate and you got it very quickly in that I ask people all the time. I'm like, well, if you want to have a hundred thousand dollars in the stock market, how much does that cost you? And and the answer is a hundred thousand dollars. And I say, but if I want to buy a hundred thousand dollar house, how much does that cost me? And Must the answer is you you, right. Yeah. In your case, nothing. Yeah. In my case, typically twenty thousand dollars. But you know, roughly between zero to twenty thousand dollars in cash, you can have an asset worth a hundred thousand dollars. And then if you want money, you know, to pay for your bills or support your family you know, you have $100,000 in stocks, well, you have to sell one of those stocks to cash flow from yeah. it, typically, right? On average, you'd need to sell $1,000 worth of stocks so you should make 1000 Real estate, your tenant pays back the mortgage and then they, they give you a little extra on top of yeah, it. Yeah, a little tip. Yeah, like I just think, you know, for you to go from such difficulty achieving, achieving leverage, you've really mastered leverage, even greater than someone like myself you know, where, to where you're comfortable with private money, you're doing no money down deals, you know, things like that. Like you're like an advanced level borrower and you're really maximizing on all the, the best things in real estate. And I think that's why you're just so incredibly successful. And I say all these things, not that you don't know them or that Chandler obviously knows them as well, but for the listener, you know, you're really an exception, but it's because you're not afraid of failure. You've, you've seen the worst. This is not the worst. This no. is n- losing a couple of rental houses is not going to be the worst thing you've ever been through if that were to happen. Yeah, not at all. And, um, I know exactly. I don't say. I almost don't know exactly what I do, but it's not right. Like I've I've been incredibly comfortable with that reality. My yeah. biggest thing is the reality I'm not okay with is anyone being able to say that I did not give them their money back. Like that's the thing. So yeah. I'll always make sure my investors are paid. Like that's my big, and that's I'm right. not saying that to, to pitch anybody, but like that, cause that's an integrity thing, you right. know? So like, cause I know people who have gone bankrupt in 2008 and like, they just sort of like F them. But for me, I think for me, the integrity of being, I mean, obviously if there's things that are decided in court, that's different, but like just from like being a person that said, Hey, trust me, you know? Cause that's what it is. Trust right. me. I need to make sure that, you know, well, I'm honoring my work. The reason you've been successful with private money, though, Jabbar, is because you have a fantastic name in this business. I know this. I'm in this business. And that's, you've made, you've kept that, and you keep your word. You give your word. You keep your word. And it's a big deal. Yeah, and I know you're going to keep doing myself, it. Myself, right. Somebody used that against me and stole yeah. $20,000 from me. Crazy. Yeah, that's So tough. what's, um. Uh, Next for you, next three years, what's your goal? Jesus yeah, what's Christ. the goal? Do you have a goal? Did we just have a blast? Three Tell years. us. The next three? My bi- my goal is to get to a million dollars a month. So okay. my goal is to be at a million dollars a month. Three years? Um, it's Gross sooner. or net? Okay. Net. Net. A million dollars a month is my goal. Um, that's like the biggest financial goal. The way that I believe that I'll do that is right now we're doing the content. I plan on building communities and, and really just if I'm adding more than a million dollars a month in value to my clients, then in return, like if I'm adding a tremendous amount, like yeah. 10 times, mm-hmm. 20 times, 50 times more than that in value to other people on that big of a scale, then that would in turn grant me with the opportunity to receive that in income. So I think Great. that would be the largest way I, because I know a lot, I've met, I know a lot of people who make a lot of money in business and the people who I know make a million dollars in real estate are all incredibly like, like, like think about it. James Dannard. Um, who else? What's his name? Like Grant Cardone makes more than a million dollars yeah. a month. 
Um, Does James Standard make a million dollars a month flipping? I think so. I, think I, I know he's incredibly wealthy. I think, I think it might be more. So That's the guy with all the Rolexes. Huh? Are you correlating them with content and kind of how they're able? I think they're making it real estate. Um, this you talking in real estate? Yeah, okay. I believe so. Um, I think James Demangi, somewhere, so close to it. Like the people who make millions of dollars. Brandon like Turner. Saying. Yeah, Brandon Turner. Yeah. Like all, all these people who make it in real estate. <laughs> I, the the level of real estate investor that they had to be at, I think, um, is not the most efficient path for me right now to be able to do that. I believe I'll be able to do that, but I think the clo- but the people I know who are making a million dollars a month who are in their twenties all have education companies. I have a friend named Kelly. She makes a million dollars a month, and she has a. Uh, a stock trading group. Mm. Um, there's these teenagers. Um, they're called Staley now. They used to be Airbnb something, and they sell Airbnb education. I have a friend named Blake. Do you know Blake? Mister Four to Eight. He makes a way. He makes a million dollars a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have his number. He makes a million dollars a month. Yeah. So you're moving into coaching. Yeah. I I want you to coach me. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I've asked you a million times, call and yell at me. I love when you're like, what have you done about your goals this week, Julie? I love that. Pay Jabbar to yell at you like he's your drill instructor instructor, and you will be a multimillionaire. That's why Marcel is. Did you not call and yell at Marcel every day? Yeah, (laughs) I yell at him more than just every day. (laughs) And look at Marcel now. Yeah, Marcel's doing amazing. Yeah, he needs to have a five star review on your coaching website. Oh, for sure. He better. Uh, I don't want to. I I I could break that tell like crazy. (laughs) 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 No one out of all the people in this world, no one can say I've helped him probably the most. He was the one that told me that you would call and yell at him, and I was like. Awesome. I was so jealous. I hate to be jealous, but when he said that you did that, I was like, man, I wish you would do that for me. makes it so easy, bro. (laughs) (laughs) We love him. We love love Marcel. We love him. I love Marcel, too, but I I just give him crap because he's like, like, I, I, like, Marcel was at a one point saying that like he felt like I wasn't helping him enough. So I was like, really? Oh. Yeah. So then I helped him achieve Challenge accepted. a lot of his goals. Um, as because he helped me achieve my goals. You know, he helped, he was. I'll say Marcel's a big per, per, um, yeah. like part of why I'm where I'm at today. Like Absolutely. especially expediting it. And so I helped him achieve a lot of his goals as well. Um, and then the way that I did it was just so aggressive. <laughs> it was just so aggressive. He told us. Know? I was like. I thought it was cool. He was a little traumatized, to be fair. He was a little bit like, he yells at me. And I'm like, awesome. And he's like, no, it's not. I yelled at him today. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we should yell at each other, Chandler. That's when we usually just laugh a lot and and it all works out. But yeah, it's not my child, but it's not like a drill instructor or I'm sunning him, nothing like that. It's not even disrespect. It's just like, this is how we've learned. <laughs> this is the level we're at in terms of just communicating with each, with me to him when like there's just either maybe not even just something wrong, but like there's a different way of thinking about this, and it's not the way you're thinking about yeah. this. How are we messing this up? <laughs> <laughs> I like, love uh, it. So we'll, we'll extend on that. How do you? I've always wondered. I'm like, that's got to be tough. Like business and your best friend together. Yeah. Like most, it's most end. Just not in a good situation. How do y'all kind of keep that friendship going? Like it's got to be pretty tough. I would say like for us, it's not we're not perfect at all. Yeah. Like we definitely get to places where we're probably a lot more business than friends. Sometimes yeah. you know, sometimes like there's just firm conversations that have to be had, and it's like it's like, but it's not like like for us, right? Like one thing about me and him. Is like if we're ever in a position where we have to be a little bit less business because someone needs like an adjustment in some type of area or whatnot, not because it's money, you know, it's like we will make that decision. So it's like, like, how do I know Marcel? Mar- Marcel has access to the bank accounts. I have access to the same bank accounts. How do I trust Marcel won't just run off with it? Because it's as simple as just asking, dude. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, like, hey, man, this is the position I'm in. This is the decision I need to make. I need access to this amount of cash. All right, well, the business can 
can afford to, for you to do that for a little bit, just make sure you pay, put it back in there. You know, not not like to that extent, like we're just taking profit from it, but mm -hmm. just like like if you absolutely are in this dire situation, like we will, we are willing to help each other out yeah. in that regard. It's never that deep. Mm -hmm. So it's like for us, we are, but we are a lot of the times more like, hey, like this is the amount that's needed or this is where the money has to go or like this is how we have to do things or this is what needs to change or I don't like how you talk to this person. I don't like how you address this situation, things like that. It's like we do have a lot of those business conversations and they're not emotional. And then even when we mess up, it's never like, dude, you effed up so bad. It's just like, all right, dude, you messed up, but so, well, what's the solution? Yeah. Like, we yeah. don't have time. We don't. We are. We are both at the point where we don't have time to be, even be mad at each other for mm -hmm. a mistake that we made. So it's just like, all right, what, what are we gonna do about it? Yeah. So what's your plan? Oh, you don't have a plan. All right, let's talk about the plan right now. What can be done? Okay, cool plan. Bam, boom, bam, bing. See you later, dude. Cool. Well, I'm gonna make that call right now. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are good at staying in your own lanes too, because I've noticed, you very. know, very clearly that you each have amazing talents and they're different lanes mm -hmm. and you master your lane and Marcel masters his and you communicate yeah, very well and I think that's that's huge it's a blessing you know that you found someone that compliments you so well so yeah he we are way like he doesn't even know what I do you know and I don't even know what he does <laughs> and you don't really care <laughs> as long as he does it give a yeah. damn. <laughs> right as long as he's doing his part you don't care and as long as you're doing your part he doesn't care either yeah we're so. both we know we're both very capable of doing business by ourselves we both are know we're very capable of trying to learn each other's roles yeah. and trying to do that if we had to but we don't want to you know we just want Hey man, I'm not trying. Like you are, the, you are amazing at sales. You're amazing at finding deals. You're amazing at keeping connections. You're amazing at acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Cool. You know this is what you understand. I'm not even going to attempt to understand mm -hmm. what you understand. I'm just going to get really good at what I'm doing, which yeah. is the project management, which is the raising of the funds, which mm -hmm. is making like basically acting as like the COO of the business. Like doing the things that need to be done so that the business plan is actually ex executed. That's me. Yeah. You know, and I'm very comfortable doing that, and I know that I can carry that skill anywhere. Yeah, that's really nice to have because most people want to be able to just do everything, and y'all just stick with what he's good at, and you stick with what you're good at. So yeah. It works well. It works really well. So. Thank you, Javar. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming on, dude. You are like a huge inspiration to a ton of people. I can't tell you how many people speak just really good things about you. And I know I'm always talking about you. So we appreciate what you do and can't wait to see uh, the next yes. multiple years. And I hope you know, Richard Poor, we absolutely adore you. Like you. your family, no, like we are your biggest cheerleaders no matter what. Like we have a lot of respect for you. And you it, it's such an honor too. to have you. I respect you guys so much. Like, I appreciate you guys for everything you guys have done for me and being there for me at all times. Like, like you guys are like my real, genuine relationship that I yeah. share. Ride or die right here. Right. So. Always. And well. sometimes where your ride or die is at the Ritz. And <laughs> that's just as fun as being at the Holiday Inn. Yeah. But it's more fun at the Ritz. <laughs> Motel <laughs> 6, Ritz on the floor <laughs> on the bridge, baby. You that's right. That's right. It. Well, if you... Like this video, please share it to anybody you can. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.